Bible, I invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. And we will be looking this morning at verses 5 through 13. 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 through 15. And here is what the Bible says. 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 through 15. Who is the one who conquers the world? But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus Christ, he is the one who came by water and blood. Not by water only, but by water and by blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he has given about his Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony within himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. This is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son does not have life. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Father, as we look at your scriptures this morning, I ask that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us to believe in your Son, Jesus. And that that belief would drive every aspect of our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Not very long ago, I can remember growing up, you were supposed to go to church. It didn't matter who you are. It didn't matter what you believed. You were just, I grew up in the South, you were just supposed to go to church. Perhaps you remember what it was like. Wasn't all that long ago. Just everybody thought that's what you do. You're, you're supposed to. I remember I had a neighbor, and he was a uh, doctor. Didn't have the slightest interest in religion. But he went to church. Why? Because he was supposed to go to church. It's where he met his clients that would come to be in his practice. There were business advantages there. My grandmother, she was president of the garden club in her neighborhood. And every woman in her neighborhood went to church. Different churches, but they all went to church. And they'd get together in the garden club and they would talk about what their churches were like, the various people they met there. Everybody went to church. It was just what you did. But today, that's no longer the case. And in some ways, that may be a good thing. Because after all, there were people who would go to church just to go through the motions of going to church. But they had no mess interest in the message of the church. In the era of John the Apostle here, people didn't go to church just to go to church. In fact, to go to church was a risky proposition. You would be scorned. You would be outcast. Nobody would go to church because you'd lose societal standing at least just to gain some cultural cachet. No, it just wasn't what you did. There was no credit for being a Christian. You would be insulted at best, lied about. You know those Christians, they're cannibals. That was how people 
literally talked about Christians in the era of the early church. They were misunderstood. They were mocked. They were persecuted. They were even executed for being Christians. I am grateful, no matter what we may think of as going on in our nation right now, that we live in a nation where those realities are not true for the church. Yet why would they endure such? I think John is confronting us with a simple reality in our text this morning, and it tells us why. They believed in Jesus. They believed in Jesus. And because they believed in Jesus, they said, no matter the cost, no matter what people think of me, I've got to be part of this Jesus-believing movement. Friends, will you believe in Jesus. That's the question John is confronting this early church in with. Will you still believe in Jesus? Oh, in this early church we read of how there was a group that was among them, but they were not of them because they did not remain. The church had schismed. We read of how there are those who claim they love Jesus but they don't love one another with acts of charity and self-sacrifice. We read of how there are people who say, I believe in God, but they have no interest in keeping the commands of God. And John writes to them to challenge them, believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Jesus. And he begins almost like a, a courtroom scene. He begins to bring witnesses before the audience he writes to. And he says, consider this witness. Consider this witness. Consider this witness. Let's look at the witnesses John brings to bear here. Chapter 5, let's start here in verse 6. Jesus Christ, he is the one who came by water and blood. Not by water and only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. All right, what on earth is John talking about here? Water and blood. What is John referring to here? This is a curious passage. I don't often like show y'all my method of how I prep sermons, but I'll, I'll let the cover back just a little bit. I've got uh, access to a bunch of different books about books of the Bible. And I try to read through the relevant portions of those books, and I, I assemble them all into one like document each week. This week's document, I drew from like nine different, what are called commentaries here, to put this together. Nine different commentaries on these eight verses here. This week's book, normally they're about 50, 60 pages long. This week's book was 152 pages long. Single space. It was 80,000 words. Gives me the word count there at the bottom. Now, I didn't read every single word, but I skimmed most of it. And you know what most of it was about? What on earth is the water and what on earth is the blood? And historically, there are about eight different interpretations of what the water and the blood are. And I will just give you a very, very, very quick overview. One person said, Augustine said, he starts this idea. He says this refers to our baptism and to the Lord's Supper. And it is the baptism and the Lord's Supper that are testifying to Jesus. And that's what he says. Now, of course, John's not said a single thing about baptism or the Lord's Supper up till this part. So we kind of go, huh? No, I don't think that's it. Another person said that it refers to the water and the blood that came out of Jesus' side when the spear was stabbed into him on the cross. Now, that one sounds a little better. 
But still, he's not really been alluding to that up to that uh, up to this point. It doesn't seem to to separate them as two different testimonies here. So I'm not sure that's it either. Another said it refers to his birth, because you know when someone is born, the water breaks. There's blood present. So it refers to his birth. It's a way of, G- of John saying G- Jesus is real flesh and blood. Of course, elsewhere in this letter, he talks about Jesus as being flesh, real flesh. So that seems to be how John talks about it. So I'm not sure that's what's going on there either. Um, another interpretation here begins to separate them. One says this is about Jesus' birth, the breaking of the water. And then the, the blood is about the crucifixion of Jesus. That seems like a, a possible understanding of this, although I'm not sure that's not really a very common way in this world of referring to birth. Though while we talk about breaking of the water, that wasn't as common back then. Another way would be, to talk, that, would be that this is talking about Jesus' ministry of baptism in his crucifixion. So that the water refers to the ministry of baptism. You know, Jesus baptized people. The problem with this view is that it, um, it, it, Jesus didn't do the baptizing. He had his disciples do the baptizing. Okay, so I've given you all these views and I've tried to boop, 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 go through them really, really quick. Why did I do that? There are good Christian people who have argued for each of these views. And sometimes we encounter a passage like this in the Bible... And it could be our instinct to think, "Uh uh-oh, I don't understand. I'm still not giving you my view. Uh, I, 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 I don't understand what this passage is about. Therefore, I shouldn't do anything with it. I should just ignore it. Or even worse, ah, the Bible's just an old book. I can't understand it. But just because there are different views on what a passage means does not mean that the, or does not follow that the Bible is not true. When John wrote this, the people who originally got it knew exactly what it meant. We've got this big distance here, but they knew when John spoke about the water and John spoke about the blood that those testified to who. Jesus is. And just because we can't always understand every little nuanced detail, it does not follow that the Bible is not true. In fact, I would suggest to you the opposite follows. Think about it. If somebody was just making up the Bible, why would they leave this in there? This is so obscure, it is so weird to us at just first blush that we would just go, ah, it couldn't be wrong. Well, I don't understand. No, if you're just making it up, you're going to make it really easy, really simple to understand. But this is rooted in a real historical event. And they obviously knew what it was. And just because we have some debates about it, it does follow that it is not true. In fact, the opposite follows because the harder it is to understand to us, the less that it would seem that this is just propaganda. So this supports, not undermines, the truthfulness of the Bible. But what does it mean? I think what John's alluding to here is he's alluding to Jesus in the water at his baptism. You recall the story there. Jesus goes down into the Jordan River to meet John the Baptist. And John says, no, no, you can't come unto me. I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus says back, no, permit it to fulfill all righteousness. And it's as if John there, 80 years old, calls to order everyone he's writing to, and he holds up water from the Jordan River. This isn't really water from the Jordan River. It's from the creek in my backyard. But he holds up water from the Jordan River. And he says, my first witness this morning is this water. Now, that's a strange witness to bring to the courtroom, isn't it? But he says, water! 
Will you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. When the water responds, I will. Water, tell us about that day when Jesus was baptized. And the water is brought forward and the water begins to testify. John had been there and he'd been baptizing and many people had been coming to him. But I remember when Jesus was baptized. Jesus came in and he came down into the water and I remember this conversation. It was different than the others. And then he went down and he was baptized. And clouds broke apart from heaven. And the dove descended. And there was a loud voice that said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. They would have known the story. Everyone knew the story. The water. The testimony to Jesus. Listen to him. Follow him. Do what he says. Believe in him. First line of testimony. The water. And there's a second. John says, you may just be dismissed. The water goes back. And next, he brings out the blood. And as strange as the first testimony was, here is a second whose testimony will be equally strange. And he brings the blood to the witness stand and he sets it there in front of the audience and in front of us, the jury. And he says to the blood, blood of Jesus Christ. Will you tell the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And the blood responds, I will. Blood, are you the blood of Jesus Christ? I am. Blood, tell us. Tell us about what happened. Tell us about where you're from. I was there. I was there when they brought him before Pontius Pilate. I was there when they took him and they took that cat of nine tails with nine balls wrapped around of of metal and of lead and they scourged his back with it 39 times to within an inch of his life. I was there running out of him as they nailed him to the tree. I was there as Jesus said... Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I was there as he said, it is finished. And the ground shook and darkness covered the whole of the earth. I was there. In my blood, I give testimony to the fact That what that soldier says, surely this man was the son of God, is true. Believe in him. The hush falls over the courtroom. What a testimony. But John's not done yet. He calls a third to the witness stand. Look at what he says here in the text, verse 6 through 8 again. Last part of verse 6. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. And perhaps something like a wind begins to rush through the sanctuary, begins to rush through the room. I'm not going to plug it in. That's too much. But, <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying here. The Spirit of God described as a, a wind, a mighty rushing wind that blows where it will. And the Spirit of God begins to rush through the, that courtroom and comes to the witness stand. And John asks him, 
Well, you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and leaves off the so help you God, because this is God. And the Spirit says, I will. I am the Spirit of truth. And John begins to ask him, Who, who was Jesus? And the Spirit begins to say, Jesus is the one who was there from before time began with me and God the Father. He is the one who was born in Bethlehem's stable. He is the one who I was there as he grew up. And he confounded the scribes and the religious leaders of his day as a boy. He is the one who began to work miracles and teach in a way none had ever heard before. He is the one who went to Golgotha, to Calvary, to the tree, to be crucified. And he is the one who three days later, I was there, and he rose from the dead conquering sin and death and letting all know that if they will believe in Him, they can be made right with God. They can have eternal life. And I am the one who now comes and I testify to Him. I'm the one who comes and comes inside of you and tells you, believe in Jesus. I'm the one when you hear the word of God, when that faith comes to you and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, I'm the one who comes and calls you to follow Jesus, to believe in Jesus. I'm the one who's saying, listen to him. And as Stephen said to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7 as he proclaimed the word, as he proclaimed the gospel, and he challenged them in verse 51, how long will you resist the Holy Spirit? Do not resist the message of Jesus, of whom the whole Bible is about, of whom the gospel message is about. Believe in him. For there are three that testify. The water, the blood, and the spirit. And these three are in agreement. Jesus is God. And he is the Messiah who saves. And only through believing in him can you be made right with God. Verse 9, if we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater. Because it is God's testimony that he has given about the Son. As if that weren't enough in that courtroom. John calls a fourth to testify. He says, I call to testify. God the Father. The foundations of the courtroom begin to tremble. The splendor of his majesty fills the room. Every knee bowed, everyone on their face, in awe of the one who's made everything. God the Father has come to court. And he testifies. And John asks the question, well, you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And God the Father responds, I am truth. Yes. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who before time began was there with me 
the Godhead Trinity, the three of us, Father, Son, and Spirit, before man was ever created. I knew what they would be like. I knew what they would do. I knew, turning to the jury, I knew you would sin against me. I knew you would reject me. I knew you would say no to me. But before time began, I chose Jesus. I, we chose to send the Son. And throughout eternity, throughout time, the Son was there giving testimony. We were sending types in the Old Testament, types of sacrifices to point to the one who would come. And then he came. And he lived the perfect life none of you could live. And there on that night before his death, he cried out to me, taking up the cup, if it is your will, Father, let this cup pass for me. And he said, no, I, it was not my will. And so he went to the cross to become the one who took on your sin to save you if you will believe in Him. Thank you, Father dismissed. Certainly that's the end. John's not done yet. Verse 10. The one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony within himself. The one who does not believe has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about the Son. John calls two more witnesses up. They're actually the ones sitting over here at the defense table. And these two represent all of us. The first he brings up and he says, you've heard the testimony. The testimony of the Father. The testimony of the Spirit. The testimony of the water and the blood. What say you to the testimony? I believe in Jesus. I will follow Jesus, says the first. Thank you. You may go free. The second comes up. What say you to the testimony? No. No, I, I won't believe. I won't follow him. But you've heard the Father. You've heard the Spirit. You've seen the water. You've seen the blood. They testify Jesus is God. Jesus, you must believe him. No, I trust human testimony. Christians are all just a bunch of hypocrites. They're all fakes. They're too stuck up. There are too many arguments. What about all the other ways? Don't you realize John's argument here is that you are arguing against God himself. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. Don't you say no to believing in Jesus. You're saying God is a liar. That's John's argument. 
verse 11. John excuses both witnesses. It's time for his closing argument. And this is the testimony God has given us. Eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Death is the great scourge. It is the one we will all one day face. But is death a house you're going to live in? Or is death a doorway you will walk through to life eternal? In Jesus there is eternal life. Verse 12, the one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son does not have life. Do you have life in the Son? Not just life to come, but a new life now. And when you have that new life, oh, it's not like the life, like the hardships of this life go away. But there's victory in them. That's what John says in verse 6. There's hope in them knowing they can't defeat you because you're in the one who has defeated death. And not only is there victory in them, there's an assurance, verse 13, that you're, that you're right with God. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you know you have eternal life. The judge stands up. It's Jesus Christ himself. He turns, he says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard the evidence presented to you. You now have a job to do. Will you believe in me? Friends, John's message here is an invitation. To those who believe in Jesus already, it is an invitation to find victory and assurance that you're right with God in Him. And to those who don't believe yet, it is an invitation to believe. To believe. To believe in the one who before time was sent to provide you with life eternal. Will you believe in Jesus? Pray with me.